So welcome again to Community Builders. Uh, week number 33, we're really excited to welcome Sharon Cado from the Métis Nation of Ontario to talk about the Métis experience. Um, so I'm going to start uh, with how we usually start in this meeting uh, with a short land acknowledgement in spirit of Indigenous Truth and Reconciliation. So Miigwech, which is Ojibwe for thank you. I'm grateful for all the nature and animals around us and the living spirit who creates them. As we gather today, although virtually on these treaty lands, we, in, we are in solidarity with our Indigenous brothers and sisters to honor and respect the four directions, lands, waters, plants and animals, and ancestors that walked before us, and all the wonderful elements of creation that exist. We acknowledge and thank the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation for being stewards of this traditional territory. Miigwech. Uh, so um, I would also like to remember that it is Remembrance Day. So uh, just to acknowledge that, we we're talking about poppies, but I thought it might be appropriate to read in Flanders Fields for us. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks, still bravely singing, fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you from failing hands we throw the torch, be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. And that's by Major John McRae, 1915. Okay, so uh, just with that acknowledgement, uh, what I'll do now is I'm going to turn it over to one of our youth volunteers as we welcome Sharon, just to explain a little bit more about what Community Builders is and what our virtual team does. So take it away, Myra. Okay, so um, I hope you guys don't mind. I actually wrote a script to this just to make sure I didn't mess up. Uh, okay, so overall, our organization works to bridge the gap between youth and adults in Halton, and we do many projects surrounding our current initiatives. Community Builders is a part of the North Oak Youth Development Council, which is a part of the Halton Youth Initiative, and uh, we've specifically been focused on Indigenous Truth and Reconciliation in Canada currently. Uh, we have many projects and initiatives we're undergoing through the various groups, such as our podcast group, our creative outreach, and our calls to action groups, and we're determined to make a difference in our community. We recently released an orange shirted video, and our podcast group is, acti is actively releasing episodes surrounding truth and reconciliation. Um, in the podcast group specifically, with, Steve, with the help of Stephen Hurley, the chief catalyst behind Voice Ed Radio, he's actually in the meeting, I think, uh, we invited Pam Demoff, the parliamentary secretary to the Min Minister of Indigenous Services, to join us for one of our episodes, and we filmed an amazing episode with her, which we published shortly to have on our right. Additionally, the Calls to Action group put effort into making an orange shirted video, which got many of the community builders youth to film short clips themselves and collaborate with it with, uh, in the making of it. And they also keep the podcast group to be guests on one of the podcasts. Um, currently, they're working on many other additional initiatives, um, and some even involve the local public library system. And uh, our creative outreach team also worked to introduce, introduce us to Indigenous artist Delroy Dumont from Onion Lake Free Nation, where we learned about some of her paintings and featured uniques, pointillism, and the meaning behind some of the beautiful artwork she does. Further, the whole group has worked to write land acknowledgements and to become more educated on matters of truth and reconciliation and how we can respectfully help and learn about the many Indigenous communities currently residing in Canada. In summary, Community Builders is a team of youth with the help of adults working to give back to the community and take part in the overall effort to achieve Indigenous truth and reconciliation in Canada. Thank you, Myra. All right, now we're going to turn it over as we introduce our guest, Sharon Cado today. I'm going to turn it over to Ethan, who is going to um, tell us a little bit about Sharon before she takes over. Yeah, so Sharon Cado is re returning to the PCMNO as vice chair for a fourth term and has served as spokesperson for the Métis Nations of Ontario Women's Council, formerly known as the Women's Secretariat since 2008. She first entered Métis politics in 1999 and in 2001 became the regional women's representative for the MNO Region 8. Sharon advocated for a community council in the western part of Region 8 and became the founding president of the Credit River Métis Council in 2003. 
In 2005, she was elected as PCMNO Regional Counselor for Region 8. Sharon's work within the M MNOWC focused on securing funding to required to carry out the, import, the important advocacy and public awareness role of the Women's Council. She's held the portfolio for women since 2006, and in 2016, Sharon was able to secure three years of funding from the status of women from the Government of Canada, the first time in history that a Métis Women's Project was funded. In 2020, Sharon was the MNOWC uh, re received the Lieutenant Governors of Ontario's Heritage Award for Community Leadership and for work done on the 2019 Women's Leadership Gathering in Collingwood. She's also the recipient of the Ontario Heritage Trust Award in recognition with her work with the Mississauga with Mississauga Heritage and the Mississaugas of the Credit New for uh, New New Credit First Nations. Vice Chair Cadeau. Who Métis, whose Métis roots have been traced to Pentanashage, was born to a proud military family in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and has lived in Germany, Nova Scotia, and Ontario. Her contributions to the Métis community include work on several different boards and communities, and she's honored to have been involved in the historic self-government agreement with Canada. A former municipal law enforcement officer for 32 years, Vice Chair Cadeau is now committed to building the Métis nations of Ontario, in Ontario and ensuring the voice of all its citizens are heard throughout the province. Thank you, Ethan, for the introduction. So Sharon, that's the intro. You've, that's, you've done a lot of great and interesting things. So we're really looking forward to hear from you. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you so much, Ethan, for that. That was uh, really nice uh, for you to read that. It's kind of embarrassing when you hear about that. But I thought I would start with a couple of videos. So um, I think it might help with a little bit of understanding first, and then we can start talking. I like uh, videos and virtual things first before, you know, somebody talks for a half hour. So if you, it doesn't matter which way you go, Siobhan. I'm going to cue that up. Okay. And I'm just going to put my uh, mic on mute and then we'll start with the Sault Ste. Marie Métis. They didn't come here. They, they were born out of here. That identity was born out of this place. We were here before Canada was Canada. And we knew that. We knew we were a proud people that had deep roots in this area. By the dawn of the 19th century, Sault Ste. Marie was home to a thriving Métis community. Métis lived on long, narrow lots along the northern shore of St. Mary's River, a system modeled after traditional Quebec settlement patterns and shared by their kin in Red River. The river lot system gave the Métis easy access to the lands and waterways upon which their traditions and livelihoods depended. Their community was documented by surveyor Alexander Vidal when he visited the region in 1846. When they get to Sault Ste. Marie, they lay out that map. We still have that map today where they lay out where the river lots are in Sault Ste. Marie to a degree of accuracy where today you can, I can walk down Queen Street and, and kind of know where whose river lot I'm on. But their claim to these river lots was in danger. Vidal had been sent to survey the land to pave the way for European settlement and resource extraction. Four years later, in 1850, the Crown sent Commissioner William B. Robinson to negotiate a treaty agreement with First Nations that would open the land around the Upper Great Lakes for settlement. Eager to protect their river lots, the Métis sought to be included in these negotiations. They were supported by Anishinaabek leaders, including Chief Xing Wakons and Chief Nevenagoching, who advocated for the Métis and demanded that the treaty include a condition to protect Métis lands by granting them free 100-acre lots. Their demands were denied. When the treaty was signed on September 9, 1850, the Métis were not included. Robinson claimed that he did not have the authority to negotiate with the Métis, but confirmed that they were in free and full possession of their lands, and recommended that the government give favorable consideration to their claims. Robinson also advised the Métis to pursue their demands with the government. In response, the Métis signed a petition stating that they had been born upon the soil, and occupied, cultivated, and protected their lands for many years. They asked for free land grants that would allow them to keep their lands, homes, and livelihoods. On 
October 21st, 1850, Robinson submitted the Métis petition to the Crown. Their demands were never acknowledged. After the treaty, what happens is, uh, you know, the, those promises are made that our land is going to be protected. The, the government then comes back and says, you, you'll have the right to purchase your land. Uh, with what resources? After the Treaty of 1850, when the whites started coming in in droves, they had no title to the land, similar to the uh, what happened in the Red River area, and they just came in and took the land because we didn't have a paper from the government saying we owned it. As European settlers, land speculators, and resource companies moved in, Métis were pushed off their lands. On October 21st, 170 years will have passed since the Métis of Sault Ste. Marie asserted their rights to the land and waters they call home and petitioned the Crown to acknowledge those rights. The Métis are still waiting for the Crown to acknowledge their claims. Great. Um, Sharon, did you want me to continue uh, with the other videos or what would you like? Um, yeah, that one I just wanted uh, people to see about Sault Ste. Marie. Like a lot of a lot of the questions I usually get are, oh, well, there are Métis people from our from out west, and I just wanted people to know that um, these little videos showed that we do we are from um, Ontario. There is uh, Métis people, and Sault Ste. Marie is one of our rich um, his, uh, historical areas, and they were actually just uh, received uh, an, an old church from the Catholic Church. And, and uh, so now they're working to make that their home. So it's just quite nice. And, and the bells rang 170 times in Sault Ste. Marie that day from, from the church that was donated to us uh, to remind all of Sault Ste. Marie, you know, that we're still waiting. But the other one is about... Um, uh, there's only one treaty um, that the Métis are included, and it's Treaty 1, um, uh, sorry, Treaty 3, and it's that there's a half-breed adhesion. So this is just a little bit of information about that I wanted you to know, too. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Métis families saw themselves as, as distinct. Uh, they were different. They had their own language. They, um, they had different cultural um, practices. Since the early 1800s, Northwestern Ontario has been home to a vibrant Métis community. Born of the fur trade, Métis families were located throughout Northwestern Ontario. They worked at trading posts, traveled to First Nations camps to trade furs, and could often be found visiting other Métis families along the waterways of Lake of the Woods, Rainy River, and Rainy Lake. My uh, ancestors were voyagers, they were traders, they worked at the Hudson Bay posts, they were trappers, they were bush cutters, they were fishermen, people of the land. The Métis developed a distinct culture and way of life. They had close relationships with First Nations in Northwestern Ontario. They traded with them, traveled and hunted with them, and often married amongst them. But the lives of Métis and First Nations would be forever changed as Canada made plans to open the West to settlers. First, it would need to secure the lands and waters of Northwestern Ontario before it could expand to Red River and beyond. In the 1870s, Canada began treaty negotiations with First Nations in the region. Métis interpreters, including Nicholas Chatelaine and George McPherson, assisted at the negotiations. However, government policy did not allow them to participate in treaty making as a distinct people. They were different. They did not um, think it was appropriate for them to sign the treaty or join the treaty as First Nations. Um, and, but they knew they were different than uh, non-original people. Uh, so and in, in order to kind of settle that issue, um, the First Nations who signed the treaty said, we have these group of families, they're half-breeds, and we would like them to sign the treaty also. But the chiefs were unsuccessful. When Treaty 3 was signed on October 3rd, 1873, the Métis were not included. Over the next two years, the Métis, led by Nicholas Chatelaine, worked tirelessly to secure their rights with the Canadian government. Eventually, in 1875, they were successful. On September 12th, Nicholas Chatelaine signed an adhesion to Treaty 3 on behalf of the half-breeds of Rainy River and Rainy Lake. 
The Treaty 3 adhesion promised the Métis reserved lands, annuities, and presence, the same benefits given to First Nations under the original treaty. More importantly, the adhesion was the first and only time in Canadian history that a collective Métis community was able to gain recognition under treaty as a distinct people. Their descendants remain in northwestern Ontario today. The Métis way of life is the life that my family has been living for generations, and it's a connection to the land that has gone back for generations. My Métis ancestors were born in this area, lived in this area, have died in this area, and we're still in this area. Okay, good stuff. Um, Sharon? Okay, um, th thank you. Um, that was just a little um, uh, video we put together for uh, Treaties Week. And I love the scenery most, too. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, a lot of, we're taking, you know, it's like he, they pieced it together. Mark St. Germain <laughs> was able to piece that together being so like still like everybody so distant you know so these interviews were from before and they are the only treaty that was signed but nothing ever happened so um that treaty um the lands that were supposed to be set aside for the metis were actually um when they had uh the residential school they that's where they put the residential school in the middle of those lands so it, um right now those lands um, with the uh, treaties and they were able to um, they gave the lands to first nations people we're we're in talks right now up there in uh, region one that we, that's what we call it, region one and we're talking with the government and we have a good group of people negotiating um, for what was promised many years ago so the next video, I just wanted you, you to see some of the things that we do with um, some of our youth that are still in school every year that we do this at March break. So that, uh, this is the next video. This week we've gathered here at the Ecology Center in near Mattawa for March break camp and this is something that we do every year where we invite Métis students in grades 10, 11 and 12 to come. Uh, we also invite some of our infinite reach students. These would be Métis students in post-secondary institutions that are helping guide um, and support Métis youth to come together along with some of our knowledge holders to essentially celebrate Métis culture and identity and to also share um, the experiences of the post-secondary students with the uh, the high school students talking about their dreams. So it's an opportunity to uh, to celebrate who we are as Métis people and to share some of the culture uh, and the traditions here in uh, what's absolutely a beautiful area uh, and to do it in a way that's really inspiring for our young people. Well this week we have a whole bunch of lovely programming. We have some traditional crafts such as finger weaving and beading. We have a whole bunch of historical games such as Voyager fur training and we also have a bunch of elders teaching skills like making sumac files and maple sugar uh, tapping. Well, a lot of Métis youth feel disconnected from their culture and it's very helpful for them to have a place where they can come to to learn these things, where traditionally they would just be taught by their parents and grandparents, but not everyone gets that opportunity. So it's great for youth to be able to come here and learn these things. Tu vas créer des mémoires inoubliables, des amitiés incroyablement fortes, puis tu vas tellement apprendre pour ta culture puis des affaires souvent dans nos propres communautés, on n'a pas autant de ressources qu'on aimerait avoir. Donc, pouvoir venir ici dans un endroit avec toutes sortes de jeunes autochtones, jeunes métisses qui sont engagés dans leur culture, c'est vraiment encourageant à voir. Et ces amitiés-là sont. Il n'y a, a pas de valeur comparable à les amitiés que tu crées ici. Je pense que c'est vraiment important pour les gens de savoir plus sur qui ils sont. Pour moi, le fait d'être venu à ce camp a appris beaucoup sur des choses que certains de mes ancêtres auraient fait que je n'avais pas idée de. Il n'y a absolument rien d'autre comme ça. Je dirais que c'est une really great vibe out here with all the winter things, all the different things we can do. You're going to meet fantastic people along the way. The counselors out here are incredibly helpful and they know a ton about being Métis. Uh, it's really just an experience that you can't get anywhere else. C'est bon, ces opportunités sont bonnes pour euh, donner la chance de célébrer leur héritage. 
de, pr de pratiquer les traditions et d'enrichir la, la façon de vivre. I think that this was a great experience so far. I definitely want to come back here next year. It's a great program and it's just been awesome. Well, I think it's important for Métis. It gets them away from their comfort zone at home. It introduces them to new friends. It introduces them to a different way of life. We're back to the land. We're back to their roots. We're trying to carry the message forward to the youth. Because after all, they are our future. Oh, I love that video, Sharon. <laughs> I think that's really fitting for what we're doing here about um, you know what? Voice. It, well, exactly. And it's like our youth are our big part of who we are. In fact, they're elected and sit on our government. So we have um, a youth between the age of 16 and 29. That's um, the youth age. And they are elected province wide to sit and to speak and to vote on what's happening. So the next part is just about signing. Finally, I can't believe it, our self-government agreement. So this is just the start of what we're working towards right now. Today, we signed the, basically the, the core self-governance agreement for the Métis Nation of Ontario with the Government of Canada. And we did that next to the Métis Nation of Alberta and the Métis Nation of Saskatchewan. All three of our governments signed these core self-government agreements, which provide recognition, finally, recognition from Canada of the Métis, uh, recognizing our, our government and essentially committing to moving forward on a path to full self-government, to a place where the Métis Nation of Ontario will actually be recognized as, as a third order of government in Canada. Métis, we're the forgotten people. You have fought to come out of the shadows. And today we take another important step. Now, Canada places a priority on a government-to-government -government relationship with the Métis Nation. Today, we are demonstrating that Canada recognizes the rights of the Métis Nation of Alberta, the Métis Nation of Ontario, and the Métis Nation of Saskatchewan, and we commit to working to ensure that your rights are not only respected, but implemented. It's an incredible achievement uh, for the Métis Nation of Ontario and also uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta to be able to sign these agreements with Canada. It means commitment from the federal government to finally recognize what they, the courts told them they should recognize, and that is that Métis rights are existing and that our rights were never extinguished. I'm really glad to be here uh, and to have been able to witness it. Uh, it's a, an incredible milestone. I think for young people to be participating in the in these sort of historic moments, I think is incredibly important. We we've, we've always said that throughout our history, young people have always been part of leadership. Louis Riel was 25 when he was elected president of the provisional government. I think it's really important that young people are a part of these things, and I think it's uh, it's really important that we're we're a part of what's happening. To be to be truthfully honest, I, I did not think I'd be this young and and having this happen. Um, as a young person, I thought it would be something down the road. So it's it's extremely exciting to be able to be a part of this. And an agreement like this really shows who we are as a people, as a political entity, not only for ourselves, but for all Canadians to see, okay, the Métis, we are a political entity, we are a nation, and it's time to be treated as a nation. So I think today's really special for that. We're going to be able to to do what our citizens need and want. We're going to be able to work on many things that our, that our people need. You know, there's a lot more to gain with the uh, collective than there is to have uh, separate entities. And I find with uh, Métis Nation Alberta, Métis Nation Saskatchewan, we're on the same page. And it's going to be a pleasure working with those other provinces together. Well, I'm really pleased to be able to sign with Métis Nation of Ontario and the Métis Nation of Saskatchewan. That was great, because now we, 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 we're we all moving in that same direction. I know we have a lot to share, a lot to support each other on. It's very important. You 
you know what? I was sitting beside one of the, the fiddlers after when she was finished and she was sitting there and I thought it's about the youth and it's about her and her future. And that's what I thought. I was so happy that we had so many young people there because the story will continue on. It's a milestone, but obviously the work in the heavy lifting will continue. Um, and for that to continue to succeed, I would encourage people to continue to work together in the spirit of the signing today. Um, and you will achieve uh, many more results for our people. And I know that's what your heart is at. Uh, and our people will be looking forward to that. So congratulations and all the best to everyone. Wow, that's a, that's really good. I love, I really love the music. It's so like happy and jovial. I love it. And I love the work that you're doing with Métis Youth. Okay, yeah. yeah. They're a big part of who we are. And it's like, you can see some of them have big beards and stuff. They're aging out. So of course, Mitch, that was his... Uh, last year as uh, being a youth before the election and so it was a great honor and just sitting beside I was sitting beside the the fiddler from um, Alberta and she she's just a young girl and she was just so excited and nervous and 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 I can't imagine you know being sitting there being so young and and thinking this is being done like so the signing of the self-government agreement is basically our first step in self-government within um on within canada so for metis nation alberta saskatchewan and ontario so we need to we're working on a constitution that type of stuff and it's so important we get the young people's voice but anyway i'll wait for you guys to ask me questions and then i can go on from there. That would be great. Well, um, I'll turn it over to the youth uh, volunteers to ask questions, but I just wanted to commend you for your work in sharing power um, with Métis youth, because that's what we're all about here too, um, elevating youth voice and sharing power with youth and some of these decision-making processes. And I don't know, I, I kind of got thinking that it would be really super cool for some of our youth to connect with potentially some Métis youth, but we'll see maybe down the road. Yeah. Okay. Um, so enough of me. I'm going to turn it over to Warda, who I believe has our first question. Okay, so my question is that where did the name Métis originate from? Okay, um, that is uh, a French term meaning mixed people. So, I mean, meaning mixed. And so we were called many different names throughout the um, years. And it depended on who you were speaking to, who, what we were called. So really, people didn't even know we existed because we never, we had, a, we have our own language, Michif, and a lot of people called us Michif. A lot of people, like the Cree people, would call us Odepemsawak, meaning the ones that own themselves, because uh, we never, we weren't like the First Nations. We didn't go, we weren't on um, reserve lands. We were free. And that was so important to us. So um, it wasn't until quite later that they figured out, oh, they even have their own language, uh, culture and stuff that we, but uh, yeah. So I think, I don't know when they started using Métis as uh, defining who we are, but that's what it means mixed. Okay, it definitely makes sense. Okay, good question, Warda. Um, okay, I believe Isabella has our next question. Um, my question is, how long have the Métis been in Canada? Well, that's, um, well, you know that we, um, half, of, half of us, <laughs> you know, when you think about it, it's a historical thing. Um, so, you can't say um, when the first white person, a lot of people say that when the first white person arrived and then six months later or nine months later, that that's not true. There's an ethogenesis that happened um, where people started. Uh, so my family, um, they worked for the Northwest Fur Trading Company, not the Hudson Bay. <laughs> when the, um, so there was, you know, there was many fur trading companies um, at that point, and the Hudson Bay Company did not want their men to intermingle with the First Nations women. 
that was something that they didn't want where my family worked for the Northwest Fur Trading Company. So in Thunder Bay, uh, there is actually a fort there and that was actually a fort from um, the, uh, the Northwest Fur Trading Company. So they actually wanted that to happen, you know, encouraged that. So the men would go out and, and marry First Nations women and they had children and their midship language is actually a blend of French and uh, so it depends on where you're from. And so there's different dialects. So um, if you're in a Cree area, it would be uh, French and Cree. If um, in Ontario, it, there's a lot of Ojibwe so, or Oji Cree. So there it would be a mixture of French and uh, Ojibwe language together. And so they develop their own language. They develop their own culture. And so I have to, I can't give you an exact date when that happened, but uh, it was, um, and then, you know, the ethnogenesis, like after years and uh, we became our own people. We were our own people before Canada was here. Right, yeah, it sounds like a, um, a very in-depth and, and complex history. So not just like one date can be specified, but um, good question. No. Uh, okay, I'm going to ask Myra uh, to ask the next question. I don't think Irini is here um, anymore. Is that okay, Myra? Yeah, it's fine. I can pull it up here. Okay. okay. Um, it's number three, right? Yep. So what differentiates the Métis from the other Indigenous communities? Um, that's a, that's a good one. Um, well, I guess, uh, first of all, I guess we can say that, um, the First Nations, uh, a lot of us actually were very close to First Nations. There's many people that could, um, they lived near First Nations. And at one point my family did, you know, they lived, um, they moved away, they lived in Penetang, Wachine, and they moved up north, uh, closer to um, a reserve, so they could be more with um, the people that they're used to being with. And I guess, is that different than any, anywhere else? Not really, right, when you think about that. So, you know, when we were called uh, Odepemsawak, which is the, the ones that own themselves, um, it was because uh, back when can before Canada was Canada, and uh, we um, we just uh, and then they were trying to when they were doing the signing. You can see from the videos that I wanted you to look at is they weren't interested in signing any uh, petitions with us or signing any you know so we weren't put on reserves and we had a choice basically. Either you can be white or you can go uh, be First Nations. And my ancestor says, no, we're Métis, so we're not going to that. So, you know, we, and I think that's where a lot of it happened. And we have to look at Sir John A. MacDonald and think about, um, you know, he just didn't want to believe that we even existed, right? <laughs> so um, we weren't... Uh, I think a famous uh, quote that he always uh, said, and it always rings in my mind, every French dog will bark the day Louis Riel is hung. Like any prime minister saying something like that today, it wouldn't be acceptable. But for some reason, um, it, it was. He was a very you know, racist man um, to um, the uh, First Nations and Métis people in the area. So... Uh, we have a lot that, uh, that are similar to First Nations, and you can see from the video, um, I believe in Sault Ste. Marie, where um, they, the First Nations were very close with, uh, with the Métis people, and they wanted them to be included, where, you know, it was always, they were always included in the gift giving, that's what they called it, and then with the petitions and stuff, but they're always supportive. We were more friends than we were enemies. Now it's all about money, isn't it? It's about, you know, when you're talking about things, it really comes down to a, a bottom dollar and people are seeing, oh, well, you're getting money and it becomes a fight. But it's basically, we're more similar than we're not, really. 
I hope that answers your question. Great question. Thank you. Um, Megan, I think you're up next. Um, so it was Louis, Louis Real Day on, it is Louis Real Day on November 16th. Can you tell us a little bit about Louis Riel? Sure. Um, well, Louis Riel was, um, we heard from Mitch, he was 25 years old when he became, I guess they had him as the leader of the Métis, but he was born in Manitoba and he actually went to school out, he went back to school in Quebec. He fell in love there and uh, when the parents found out that he was uh, Métis, um, the marriage wasn't allowed because uh, they were the lowest of the, the people back then. You know, you don't want to, uh, with those savages type of thing, you know, they're, they're, they're no good. So basically he went back to uh, um, Manitoba and that's when, so Ontario, it started first with the, 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 um, signing treaties with First Nations and ignoring the Métis um, Kenora area that want the last one we see it about the, the video where they did sign um, an adhesion to Treaty 3 but nothing was ever done. So then they moved down to Manitoba and they were doing some surveying and the Métis people saw them and told them to get to get out. So they realized that uh, they needed to come in and talk with uh, the, the Métis there. Uh, Manitoba actually was named after what Louis Riel, it was uh, one of his lists of uh, things that he wanted. And really, if, if you look at that list today, it's just what we call as being diversified, you know, uh, including English just as much as French, including, you know, just to be equal to everybody. But at that point, it wasn't something that was accepted. But he, um, so I, I guess uh, with um, Thomas Scott, there was a young man and um, he actually, he was, okay, I have to go back to Ontario. So back it, when Ontario, when you think about Ontario back in the 1800s, it was orange country. So do people know what that means? No? Okay. So um, that it was, um, we're talking, um, they were Protestants. So Protestants did not like Catholics back then, you know, and Métis people were half Indian, half, and they were Catholic. So all the things you wouldn't want in a person. That's Basically, so my family from Ontario, we kind of were kind of hidden. So with Louis Riel, he was, they were Catholic, very religious, and Indian. So when you go from that point of view, so they, um, Thomas Scott was an orangeman from Ontario, and he they captured him, and I can't remember why. Like something happened, but they ended up killing them, him, and uh, the the their provisional council of the Métis Nation. That's what they called themselves. So he actually um, he went to the states, and uh, he um, and he was there for a while. Fell in. He met a woman. Fell in love, and then when when the government was moving westward for the railway, when they came to Saskatchewan, the same thing was happening again with uh, the, the troops and stuff like that. So they, ran, they went and got Louis Riel. So he was 25 at this point, just a young guy. When you think about it, when he was young, um, he came back to help um, them to try to save their lands. So this was a, um, they have, uh, they had churches, there was uh, families living in this area where the Gatling gun was first used. So we've never had a war in Canada, but there was a war within, with the Métis people. So when 
um, Sir John A. Macdonald found out that Louis Riau was back in Saskatchewan, they sent troops from Ontario. So basically, um, if you um, let's support our troops. So if you were looking, if you read the papers and you were a Métis person, you didn't want to tell anybody you were because come and get heating oil 50% off if you support the troops. You know, let's get those, uh, those half-breeds, those, you know, that type of thing. It was really a racist place, but also you didn't want to say anything. It was just very disturbing. They would um, talk about the people that were um, injured, like the, the, set, the uh, soldiers, they would give them names, but they killed like women and children. And uh, they were just said, you know, one half breed, you know, one child half breed, one boy half breed, you know, they didn't even give them a name. But uh, so when they sent the troops from Ontario out to uh, Saskatchewan, they brought this new invention, the Gatling gun. So um, that's what they used in a, in a town. So it, it was very sad. You can see, so I was walking around and um, out there in Batoche, and uh, you could see the bullets, like where they went into the church. They, they, they were shot the church. They, they did everything. So, and that's when he, um, he gave up, you know, so they, he was captured, along with First Nations people too. So they were all fighting together in order to keep their land. They didn't want the railway to go through. This is, they're living here. This is their land. And um, so Louis Riel was the first one to be hung. But when we talk about um, a trial, the trial was with, supposed to be of your peers. Well, there were, um, I guess, 10 people, but uh, they weren't of his peers at all, basically. So... Mm -hmm. I, it was a very, when you think about it, how sad that was. And, and people still talk about Louis Riel today. Um, and and he, all he ever wanted was just things to be the same for everybody. You know, just if you, I, I wish, um, I'll try to find that and send it off to Siobhan. But the list, the things that he wanted to, um, to go into, like it was Blair Real that actually was elected two times, but never got to sit in parliament, but he actually did go in the middle of the night, signed his name to our parliament in, in, in Ottawa. Uh, so he, uh, it was him that brought Manitoba into the Confederation, into, into Canada, and he had a list of his agreements. But it, it's very sad. So every year we celebrate his life. We celebrate what he did for us and what he did, you know, for like, you know, it's, you think that he, he gave his life in order for something that he really truly believed in. Like many of his famous quotes, you know, are about youth. You know, he was, and he has a, a book on, on, um, poets too, like poetry that he wrote, but it's a very, very sad thing that happened back then. But we were the only ones. And, you know, when Canada, you know, took the Gatling gun to our fellow Canadians, really, like we were here first. So, and then after that, there were um, a First Nations chiefs that were hung for the same reason. That sounds like such a, like, um, I don't know. That's a really sad history. And that would like be so amazing. Like, thank you for sharing some of that um, history. It sounds like there's so much more to learn about that. And we'd love um, some resources if you could send those to us. So thank you for giving us that, um, that snapshot about Louis Riel as that, that day comes up. Thank you. Um, just for the sake of time, because I see that uh, we have quite a few more questions and um, we have like 15 minutes. I'm going to turn it to Melissa now. Melissa, your question. Um, so my question is, how did you learn about your Métis ancestry? Yeah, that was something that was hidden from me until I was 39 years old. My grandfather passed away. And um, at the funeral, I met my some family. My dad was very good at uh, not in introducing. Now, I know it might sound very strange to a lot of you here, but 
I was a military brat, so we never lived around here. So it was very easy for my father not to talk about it. My mom had no idea either. So he, when, we, when my dad got stationed to Downsview, uh, we moved to Streetsville because he was uh, going to get out of the army. So um, he would go up north um, and to his family, but we were never included. So I, I had no idea, never met them. I only knew my grandfather. So I bet um, my, grandma, my grandmother had passed away, so I had never met her, but it was her sister I met. And she said, oh, it's so nice to meet you. And, you know, did you know we're 18? I'm like, what? <laughs> I had no idea. So at 39 years old, I'm sitting with my great aunt and I find out that's what I am. And I, I couldn't believe it. I could not believe that my father never said anything, but I looked at him so differently that day to think. Like, why couldn't you say something? And he was told, and I asked him, and he was told because they were told not to. Because it was just better, right? So, you know, to be French is not, you know, my, maid, my, my maiden name, that's what I go by, Cadeau, um, is French, right? But uh, it wasn't a good thing to be French, and it wasn't, still wasn't a good thing to be Indian at that time. So he just never told anybody because that's what his mother told him to be safe right just don't tell anybody and that story goes on and on and on so right now we have people so the my dad he got um uh four years ago a medal from korea for him for being in the korean war um he had dementia so he was uh but uh president fro um, you've seen her talking. And so she was there and she went up to him and he goes, uh, she, and he goes, Oh, you, you have a sash on. And he goes, and he had his sash on and he's looking at her and he, he goes, he, she goes, well, I'm Métis. I'm the, from the Métis Nation of Ontario. I'm Métis, you know? And that was the first time that I heard my father say that the first time. And uh, to me, that was just like, I can't tell you how I felt. And can you imagine not knowing? It would be something that, uh, you know, it, it's just so devastating. So now we celebrate it. So it's so important for our youth to be involved because it's youth guys that are going to make the difference. We have a youth council. We have elected people, a yet elected youth from each corner of Ontario that sit at a council. And there's nine of them. So we have nine areas. And then with the one youth that sits there on with the government, with, the, with us, and tells us what they need in order to do things. They are amazing what the youth did. So the one video that I showed, like that you've seen, I don't know if you noticed, but there was a beading jar. There was a jar and it had some beading in it. Well, they actually, what they did is they got together and they thought, hmm, we need to make money. We want to make sure our youth have things. So um, they, st they put together a beading kit. Well, for us, that's because we were also known as the flower beadwork people, right? We had many different names. You know, they didn't realize we were one person because we were, you know, oh, oh, de Pemswack, oh, flower beadwork people, you know, oh, they're the same. Um, so they actually sold those kits and i don't know how much money they made but they made a lot they actually give out um bursaries to the youth they um they actually have grants you know that they give to the youth there so on community councils there's a youth and so if the youth wants money that's given from this the beadworks uh kits they actually have kits for the veterans so um and then they make poppies with them and and then the money goes to the veterans. Like they are the most, like they're fabulous. They actually have a tea series going right now. So they have a tea series going and uh, they have different people. So they had a, um, one of our university professors, he's in the States, but he's one, he's a Métis. Um, and, you know, they, it, it, it's fabulous. It's very, very popular. So I can send you that information too if you wanted to see what they do. It would, would be, be great. It would be great to connect. Like 
Yeah, I, I just think it's our youth are so fabulous. It's just amazing. I can't imagine where we're going to be in our future. Oh, that's amazing. And yeah, a lot of what our work is, is just, um, again, with non-Indigenous uh, youth volunteers at this table, connecting with some Indigenous youth, uh, getting those voices, um, uh, and also that opportunity to express uh, their experiences. Awesome. I see some possibilities for sure. Okay, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to skip down. Actually, Karen has the next question. We have a few more questions left. Okay, so my question is, can you give us an example of how you and others contributed to uh, the community building of the Métis Nation of Ontario? Oh, that's hard, because you know what? To me, it's like always a team. It's always a team. But I have to say it was our ancestors that got us to that point. So that just happened January, the beginning of the year, January 2020, before COVID, before all of that, when we were in Ottawa signing that self-government agreement. And we weren't in the same, not in the parliament where Louis Riel was kicked out because, you know, it's all closed and stuff. So it was another place. But just sitting there thinking about every, what, has happened up to this point. So uh, my family's from Penetang Machine, from the Drummond Islanders. So it's kind of a, um, so Drummond Island is part of the States now, but with the War of 1812, that used to be Canada. And they were living there and after the, with the Treaty of Ghent, and they, for some reason, said, okay, you can have Drummond Island. Well, we were there for another, like, 12, 15 years when the U.S. government went, oh, my gosh, that's our land. So it was November um, 1829 when they came and they kicked us off. So then we went um, to St. Joe's and then over to Penetang Machine. But Penetang Machine, they also had... Um, they also signed the same thing as what happened up in Sault Ste. Marie. So uh, pen, uh, they, their petitions. So my family, I had four of my ancestors that signed that petition to say the same thing as what uh, Sault Ste. Marie. We want to be included in the gift giving and we want to be able to keep our lands. And uh, so these kind of things, all of these things happened. And so everything had to happen in order to for us to be where we are today so i can't it's just so many people like so many when you think of you as a person how many people did it take for you to be here when you think of all of your ancestors and your grandparents and your great-grandparents and all of those people standing up you know in sault st marie before um, um robinson came up they went up to uh, start surveying. Well, it was the Métis and First Nations that went and stole the gun from the uh, Hudson Bay trading post and they turned it on the, the Quebec uh, uh, mining company. They said, you're not coming here. This is our land. You know, so these things all had to happen for us to be where we are. Sorry, just somebody unmute. Thank you. Um, Okay, I think, um, Irini, uh, you're next up with a question. Um, I sent you a message in the chat as well. How do you think youth can make an overall impact on Indigenous truth and reconcili reconciliation? Well, you know what? First of all, I have to say, um, you guys are all amazing. I don't, I don't know what your ages are. What are the ages between... Uh, I think we're a range. Well, our uh, project specifically um, focuses on youth ages 13 uh, to 17, but there may be a little variance. That's awesome. Because I can tell you that uh, we have adults that don't even know what you know. <laughs> so I think by talking about it um, in a positive way, because uh, when people ask, oh, well, you're Métis, aren't you lucky? you don't have to pay taxes. That's my first question. The second one is, oh, well, you don't look Métis. Well, I don't know what that's supposed to mean. Like, what am I supposed to look like? I don't know, right? It's just like, what is a French person? What's a Canadian look like? <laughs> it's the same kind of weird question for me, but um, I think if you could keep talking about it in a positive way, and uh, because I can tell you, you guys are amazing. And you have so much knowledge right now. 
And there's so many older people that are my age that have no clue. What does that mean? Because when I went to school, I did, I, Louis Braille was a trader and uh, the Indians just were, you know, nothing, you know, like it, it's, so people didn't learn anything. And I think if you keep talking about what you've learned and uh, I think uh, the word gets around and, and that would be something that would be so beneficial for all Canadians to know. Great. Um, we have just, uh, I think, two more questions. Uh, and that's Kat. I think you're next. Hello. Um, so what specific types of activities do you think non-Indigenous allies should be doing to help with Indigenous truth and reconciliation? Well, I just think what you guys are doing is just it. <laughs> I think you're perfect what you guys are doing because I can say that I don't know a bunch of young people that are doing anything better than what you're doing. Like, I think it's amazing. You all got together and I, I just, I'm blown away by, by you guys. I really am. I think you're all amazing. And I'd like to see where you are 10 years from now, because if you're not in, you know, like I know you're all going to be something fabulous, you know, all with a voice. So, but I think what you guys are doing are amazing. But I would love to see you connect with, because um, I, I don't know if um, the Mississaugas or the New Credit have a youth group, but I know that we do. And it would be also nice, um, the Inuit um, people, like I know that, is it uh, Pactuatit? Um, I, I know they might have a youth group too. So I think connecting with uh, people your own age from different cultures is something is so fabulous. So I can find out about Pactuated and uh, to see about them. It would be nice to connect, you know, together. I think that would be um, amazing. And I think in terms of building those relationship pieces uh, with truth and reconciliation, that it's more than just um, inviting people on to talk, right? It's, it's about, okay, so what do we do? Uh, with some of that talk, how do we continue those conversations and build those connections, especially with the younger generations? Uh, so thank you for that, Sharon. Um, okay, and our final question, I believe, uh, goes to Ashley. Hi, so my question is, what do you think the government can do to improve how Indigenous people are treated? Well, uh, we can talk about the, the water, boiled water advisory. That's been 25 years in First Nations. I think, you know, um, that has to happen. Enough is enough, right? So I, I, when I think about, I don't just think about me as Métis, but I think about everybody. So when you think about that, there's no community. If, when we, if we had one community that had to boil water, how long would that last? That was, there was one community that had a water advisory and some people died, but that didn't last long. So why is it acceptable on First Nations land, right? Like, uh, I think we can all drive through a reserve here and we see it's pretty nice. But I tell you, you go up north, it's not really nice. They don't have the homes, the housing. So there's like two families living in a home. They can't do their homework. So these types of things is not acceptable for me. So, and I don't think they should be acceptable for anybody. Yeah, that sounds like there's still a, a lot, a lot of work to be done with the, this reconciliation piece um, in our nation. Yes, no, there is. Yeah, um, but uh, it's it's encouraging like the great strides that uh, the MNO has made uh, so far. So hopefully that mo momentum keeps going. And as uh, the younger generations uh, grow and take on leadership positions, uh, some of this information now understanding, um, talking to others, learning, trying to empathize, um, connecting, uh, that will all play in to um, building on to that reconciliation piece. Well, we have um, also a post-secondary rep that sits on our, 
our government and uh, Hannah, and she is just an amazing young person that, you know, elders aren't just old people. People with knowledge are elders. And I look to her. She is one amazing person, you know, so I just look at that. And I think everybody here that you're here and it's amazing. So I look at all of you is you all have so much knowledge and you all have so much information that you can pass out to everybody. And uh, you all are just, I don't know what to say, but just all that, I just, you, you've left me speechless with all of you. So thank you so much for, uh, for asking for me to come. And I really appreciate it, each and every one of you. So I look forward to seeing you in the future. I know that I'm gonna say, I've seen her before. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Sharon. Um, Myra, I'll turn it over to you, but I'm, I'm really appreciative of your time. Okay, so just wanted to say thank you so much for uh, coming onto the call. And uh, we were wondering before everyone leaves, if there's, if there's anything you'd like to share quickly with the youth and the rest of the group here. I think I talked a lot, so I, I think <laughs> I did. But um, yeah, so I'd like to get you that information with the youth. I'll pass along what the T-Series to see what they're doing. And I'll try to find out the other information about the Inuit youth. I know that there's a Toronto community. There's, there's a Toronto Council for Inuit. And so I'll try to, I'll send you that information too. So they could have that. That's amazing. I'll follow up with a message after uh, today's meeting. But um, I just like to say again, thank you, Sharon. It's been, uh, for me, uh, it's been really enlightening. Uh, you shared a lot of knowledge. I really think the videos were a really good idea, actually. <laughs> it well, kind, it kind of broke it up a little bit too. Well, it's just it, videos, it just shows, it, it has more information than what I can really explain when uh, you see other people and stuff. And just us as a people, like, you know, it, it's just, uh, it's amazing. You know, when you see the youth, at, that were there, you know, that were at the self-government signing, you know, they were there too, because they're so important. It's not just all old people. Our youth were there. We had more youth than anything. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, so we're looking forward to continuing this conversation. Uh, if anyone who hasn't had a chance to speak today, if you have any other questions for Sharon or can think of anything, how we can connect, uh, just shoot me an email and then uh, I'll send it Sharon's way if that's okay, Sharon. Um, yeah. And yeah, let's keep the conversation going. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and making us, raising our awareness about the Métis in our country. Thank you to everyone today. And uh, you may now leave the meeting. Have a good day. Bye, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Good stuff.